substantial improvement, substantial damage. Existing buildings must meet the requirement for new construction, the elevation requirements, if the cost of improvement or cost of repair damage exceeds 50% of the market value of the building prior to the improvement of the damage. This is the FEMA 50% rule, if you've heard that term before. Important thing to remember is it's the market value of the building. It does not include the property. The reason that's important is I can have this old bungalow, old ranch style home that's worth like thirty or forty thousand dollars, but it's on the beach and now it's worth one point six million dollars. But when somebody wants to revamp or refurbish that house or repair it after some damage, they're limited to half of whatever the house is worth, thirty or forty thousand. So what kind of damage is included? Any kind of damage. It does not have to be flood damage. Everybody thinks that the 50% rule only applies to flooding. So if my home is worth $50,000. And it's below base flood elevation, you can only put $25,000 back into it before you would be required to raise it up. If you raise it up above base flood elevation, I don't care how much money you put into it then. I'm just trying to think. Um, like when Sandy took place, right, in order for them to get like the ICC money, they had to provide a letter from the town saying that their home was damaged more than 50%. So I guess the community determined that the home was damaged more than 50% of the market value. So if the home was, let's say, 100000 and you're saying, you know what, the damage, if the building itself... No, and that brings up a good point because we'll talk about ICC, increased cost of compliance. In order to qualify that for that, because some of what that's used for, we'll see the four parameters, you would have to say, hey, that is substantially damaged. But yeah, as far as this goes, it's 50%. Of so the market was, value of the actual, just the actual building. Just the building, not the land, just the building. And the damage can be from anything. Fire, wind, termites, people, trees. In our area, we have sinkhole damage. That's a huge one because to repair a house from a sinkhole, could be 70 or 80,000. Just trying to repair the sinkhole could put it into the substantial damage, substantial improvement. But it also says improvement. Maybe nothing is wrong. Maybe I just want to make this house a lot nicer. Those are the people that hate me when they come in and go, hey, I want to make this, I just bought this house. It was a piece of junk. I'm going to make it really nice. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And I'm like, no, you're not. I say it a little more tactfully, but I'm like, oh, I don't think you can. <laughs> but the idea is you're not unless you elevate. And we did have that recently. We sat down, the, you know, our plans examiners denied the plans, the people were livid. And of course, you know, sometimes some of my employees aren't the best at explaining things. All they had to do was explain to people they only had to elevate the home. The home was only three inches below base flood elevation. They're talking about taking the whole roof off and everything, so they came in. They were yelling at me and everything, so I'm taking all the hits. And I said, sir, ma'am, I don't think anybody explained to you your house is only three inches below base flood elevation. Just well, yeah. Floor. I was like, all you got to do is pour three or four inches of concrete in the floor, raise the plumbing. You're talking about taking the whole roof off and gutting the interior anyway. Oh, well, how much can I spend it? I was like, as much as you want. <laughs> and the guy's like, so you're telling me if I go in my whole house and pour three or four inches of concrete, I said, no, you're going to have to have an engineer verify everything. He goes, yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take care of that. He said, so like I just increased the plumbing stacks and everything. I get the engineering. I had four inches of concrete. I can do whatever I want. I was like, yeah. He goes, we're done here. And he just left. I was like, there you go. <laughs> and of course, my plans examiner's like, he was yelling at me. I was like, that's because you didn't explain all the details. But that's, so it's not just damage, but it's also improvements. So what do we call an improvement? Any reconstruction, remodel, rehabilitation, addition, or improvement, the cost of which is equal to or greater than 50% of the building's pre-improvement market value. What is damage? Damage of any origin. We just talked about that. Where the cost to restore the building to its pre-damaged condition is equal to or greater 50% of the building's market value before the damage occurred. Once again, it does not have to be a flood. Fire, termites, wind. Vehicle impact. We've had those where we have a car runs into a building, and all of a sudden, that if the building was only worth thirty or forty thousand dollars, that could cross that fifty percent threshold. What kind of cost do we include? All the structural items, any hardware used, finished items, utility service, tile, plumbing, 
HVAC and the market value of the labor. We get that a lot where people come in, oh, I'm going to do all the work myself so I don't have to count the labor. Yes, you do, because it's still considered market value. Well, I'm going to do it really cheap. Well, you still got to provide what you think is going to be the value of your labor. What's not included, the design cost, outside improvements, we don't care what you do to your yard because if we're not counting land, we don't, we don't care about the landscaping. The contents, I don't care what kind of furniture you put in there, that doesn't count. If you have to obtain any surveys, do a cleanup, or any of the permits, that kind of stuff is not counted. Historic structures. Historic structures are an interesting caveat, they're a little unique. They are exempt from substantial improvement requirements if it's on a historic register, state, federal, local, what have you. It just can't be old. You can't just say, oh, I got a building here, it's from 1917. Really? And that's it? And then you go in it from 1917, but you go on in the inside, it's all been updated and everything. All they're saving is the out. I'm like, no, it's got to be considered historical. And it integrates all possible flood damage reduction measures and a project, the project maintains status of the structure. This log cabin I took, it's from downtown Dallas, Dallas, Texas. It's one of the historical cabins there. So if there was damage here, do I want to see that thing elevated 12, 14 feet in the air just to say it's flood protected? I kind of lose the context of the cabin. Is somebody staying in that cabin? Is somebody sleeping there? Is somebody living there? No. So, I mean, that's where historic structures, historic structures, we kind of, that's almost akin to the way that the ADA is. When we talk about accessibility, you know, if that's elevated, then I have to put an elevator in it, a ramp. I mean, am I going to do all that? No. So when we talk about historic structures, they have their own little caveat. The idea being that they may not be occupied, they may not be used in a general situation because they are historical. But they have to be registered. They're just not old.